hearts into your heart, O oh God. We ask for that revelatory spirit that was, with upon, that was upon David to rest upon us. Lord, we want to see what he saw. Then we will worship like he worshiped. Lord, we want to see the things he saw. Then our hearts will be strong before you in difficulty. So I ask for that revelatory spirit, that spirit of revelation in the Word of God about the beauty of the Lord. You would be our portion, our, oh God, our cup, our inheritance forever. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. That uh, phrase I just prayed is from Psalm 16, verse 5. It's one of the uh, main uh, Davidic themes of his life, one of the great themes of David. Psalm 16, verse 5, I'll just quote it, I'll mention it a few more times, that he ascribed to God as being his portion, which meant you are my, and he said, you're my portion, my cup, my inheritance, you are my reward, is what he's saying. The thing that gave David strength as the rule of his life is that he literally connected with the Lord as his primary reward in this life and in the life to come. And when the earthly promises, the natural promises, is a better way to say it, that God gives us, when those become secondary and the Lord becomes our primary reward, then the bottom line is we carry the reward with us when we're disappointed. When we're dis disappointed in earthly circumstances, we carry the reward everywhere inside of our heart with us. It's a reward where neither moth nor rust can destroy, or thieves cannot break in and take. It's a treasure we carry with us everywhere we go in this life and in the life to come. And again, the secret to David's life was the, the rule of victory that was in his life. He didn't have a, a permanent, un, uninterrupted victory, but he had a rule of victory throughout the 70 years of his life on the earth. That was the that was the rule of his life, though he had periods when he did not have a hold of that. But the secret was, is that the Lord was his portion. And it's stated a number of times in the book of Psalms. Instead of the word portion, put the word, you are my reward. You give me a sense of pleasure greater than the earthly promise in natural things will give me pleasure. The pleasure I feel from you... The unfolding of, this, of your beauty to my heart and the beauty I have in you is actually more powerful to my heart than even the release of the honor and the favor before people and in circumstances. Of course, that's the whole purpose of the trials David's going to go through is that the Lord wants to strengthen that reality in him. Every time that he's going to confront the trials we're going to talk about in a moment, the point of it is is to get him to realign his heart with God as his portion and his reward. Because when we go through difficulty, there's a certain uh, kind of mental exercise that you automatically go into. When you find discomfort in earthly circumstances, the most automatic natural human response is, is to find a way of thinking that causes you to have comfort or have relief from pain. When the pain comes, we search for, you know, it's like our computer mode. We're searching every file. For comfort, comfort, relief of pain. Somewhere, somewhere. Where's the mindset? We try to come up with something that gives us a sense of relief of the, of, of the pain. If we look to natural things, then that search is called anxiety. If we look to the spiritual reward, then that search is called faith. Really, that's what it is. It's the search for comfort. So we're searching all of our information files to find something that relieves pain. You know, the, the money is going to come in and the person will say yes and the door will open, but we never can lock into it in a substantial enough way to take the pain away. So we think about it, uh, we twist it and turn it a hundred different ways. My ministry will release. The favor of man and of God will be on me here. This will happen, that will happen, the anointing. But I'm not sure. And so we can never actually find comfort when we work in that arena. And when we search for comfort through uh, seeing earthly circumstances change, again, we call that anxiety. When we search for that same relief of, from pain in the discovery of the Lord, we call it faith. I mean, it's really a search for relief from pain. It's really what it is. If you do it the right way, it's anxiety. If you do it the wrong way, 
It, uh, I mean, the, the wrong way it's anxiety, the right way it's called faith. And the Lord told David, He said, David, you're built in such a way, by my own design, you can't find the superior pleasure outside of the discovery of my beauty. You're simply built that way. There's limitations built into you. You cannot find the superior pleasure outside of the discovery of my beauty and the implications of it. So David would lock into the reality that God was his portion. That's what he meant. You're the one that gives me the feeling of reward. You're the one that brings the superior pleasure. It's the discovery of you and the enthrallment I feel in my heart when I see a little bit more what you look like and a little bit more what I look like to you. That gives me that impulse of pleasure called joy in the Lord. And so when David would get disconnected from that, then a pressure would be created to realign him. Because at the end of the day, we all search for ways to get free from pressure and pain. Every one of us is very natural. You can't repent from that. You can only search in the right way. So in my own personal life, the search that I've gone through goes something like this. Okay, all these areas are falling apart. It could be economic areas. It could be your ministry. It could be relational areas. It could be physical pain in your body. It could be the things you're building or breaking. It, you know, it, it, whether it's in the job or the church world or whatever... And that's happened to me a number of times, like it's happened to you, and it will happen a number of more times. And so I start thinking. I go through the philosophical checklist. Why am I doing this anyway? Why am I, why am I reaching for this so hard anyway? Well, if I, if I succeed in it, then I will be happy. But you wasn't happy last time we succeeded. I know, but it will be different this time. Why will it be different this time? I don't know. Quit asking so many questions. I will be happy. No, you won't. Not really. Okay. Why am I happy then? Why do I breathe on planet Earth? What? What's going on? God says the uncreated God filled with beauty likes you. Oh, that feels good. And I have made you to like me back. Oh, that feels good to like you back. You are loved and you are a lover. My beauty I will unveil to you and I will show you your beauty in me. That feels good. Wow, well I got that no matter what else breaks. And we begin to realign ourselves through that. I've done that exercise, I'm sure like some of you in this room, 10,000 times 10,000 in the last 20 years. I am loved and I am a lover of God. That's why I'm successful. Wow, things can be broken and I can still succeed. Wow, that feels good for a few moments. Wow, okay. Pain is now relieving. A minute and a half later, the pain's back. Okay, okay, let's do this again. How can I get free from this pain? Why am I doing this anyway? It never works like it's supposed to work. Nothing ever lines up like it's supposed to. Well, if it did line up, it wouldn't really work anyway. Okay, why do I live and have, breathe and have life on planet Earth? Because I love you and I've made you to be a lover of me. I want you to discover my beauty and your beauty in me. Wow, those feel good. I am loved by God. I'm a lover of God. Therefore, I'm successful. That's what I believe David did. It's realigning our heart with truth. And those momentary releases of the superior pleasure touch our heart. The inferior pleasures of life, some of them legitimate and some of them sinful, the legitimate ones and the sinful ones, which the simple ones are perverted forms of the legitimate ones, they still are not the superior pleasure. The superior pleasure of life in this age and the age to come is when God reveals God to the human spirit. He's built to sin that way. We can't get free from that reality. No matter how much we try, we are simply limited in our human experience to that dimension of, of life, which assures us of walking in the glory of God. God built in those limitations, those defaults, if you will, those those limitations, those boundaries to drive us into the glory of God. He built us into that. But we resist it all of our life. And then, in a, and then we stand before the Lord in eternity and we say, why did we resist this? It was such a wonderful plan. It was such goodness that you put limitations on us to hem us into that reality to find comfort. David discovered it early on. It was part of the Lord being with him, that spirit of revelation that was on him. David connected with God as his portion in a very unusual way at a very young age. And that's what made him distinct. That's what caused him to be one of the great authors of Scripture. He wrote so prolifically that which was considered the Holy Writ. The 
Word of God. God gave him, for the sake of others, that extra measure of understanding. And for 3,000 years, the church has lived in the benefit of it, or the redeemed have lived in the benefit of it for 3,000 years. He wrote this 1,000 years B.C. approximately. The Lord says, I gave him an extra dose of it so that multitudes could drink out of that well all their life. Beloved, the sooner we connect with this reality, the reason we are successful is because the God of infinite beauty desires us with a passion and He's made us beautiful in Him and given us a heart to love Him back. Even in our immaturity, the love counts and it's real. And it lasts forever. That is the measure of your success. Pain makes us align ourselves with that truth because we search for comfort. Every one of us. Pain makes us, it forces us to search for comfort and we keep checking out every little, you know, uh, uh, you know, body of information we can search out in order to, to uh, get relief from pain and we find it in that vein of truth. And the more we do it, it's called a renewed mind. Another word for a renewed, a renewed mind is aligning your heart with truth. Realigning your mind with truth. You get your mind aligned with it, eventually it gets into your emotions by the Holy Spirit. You align your mind with it, you align your speech with it, and eventually when God sees your mind reaching for it, you're speaking it to your soul. David was constantly telling his soul what truth was. He says, I have my mind around it, I have my speech around it, and the Holy Spirit says, that's the context of which I give revelation to the heart or I change the emotions. See, you can't change your emotions, only God can. God, say, God says, you change your mind and I'll change your emotions. The way to change your emotions is by redirecting your mind. We change our mind, God changes our emotions. We can't make ourselves feel, we can only line our minds up in a way where we pull up, put a bullseye on our heart and the Holy Spirit in the context of thinking in the right way gives us the spirit of revelation which changes our emotions. And so David's model of transformation was to line his mind up with truth. And of course, the easiest way to line your mind up is by speaking it. You know, I, I learned some years ago that in my personal prayer life, if I just barely, just even so, so softly whisper my prayer, my thought life comes into uh, obedience. I found that when I, when I prayed in, just in silence, my mind could wonder. When I prayed in just an ever so slight a whisper, my mind had to stay with my speech. So David incorporated the principle of speaking, actually verbalizing the things that he was sowing his mind in. And when your mind and then your speech lines up with truth, even though you don't feel it, that's the context of which revelation comes by the Holy Spirit and changes the emotions. The emotion is impacted when it's touched by revelation. God changes your emotional makeup, your emotional chemistry by, this, by giving you revelation. When your heart has revelations, your emotions feel it. How can I get more revelation? Fill your mind. Fill your mind. Well, my mind, it's hard to fill it up. Get your language in line with what your mind's trying to be filled with. And you'll find that over and over. We'll look at that several times tonight in the Psalms. David filled his mind and his speech with a certain thing. And then that, that was the context for the spirit of revelation to touch the heart. And when God touches the heart with the spirit of revelation, that is called, you feel the truth of it then. You feel the truth. So the Lord says, Mike, I've made you in such a way to where the, I've hemmed you in. I've locked you in. I've put, I've put boundaries on both sides. You can't find pleasure outside of me as a superior experience. And that's the road I'm paving to lead you into the glory of God. I've bound you in this. Well, I want to find the superior pleasure in legitimate things, and sometimes in illegitimate things, and the Lord says, no. Legitimate and illegitimate natural things are secondary. You can only find superior pleasure if I am your primary reward, and the things that I've given to you become your secondary reward, your, your secondary issues of life. And when the, when the Lord is our primary, the discovery of the beauty of the Lord and our beauty in the Lord, when that's our primary reward, then we actually can handle secondary things without them destroying our lives. And David's life is a, is a, uh, is a journey into this truth and depth. Now the way that the journey works, it isn't that once you go from level one to level two of 
understanding, you stay at level two. It really is three steps forward, two steps back. But you're constantly progressing over the months and years. You're constantly progressing. Though you might have weeks and months where it feels like you're going back because the Lord's, the Lord's ways are, are hard to discern and hard to measure. I don't, like I said before, one thing I am adamant about is not measuring how I'm doing. I just, just do not measure how I'm doing. I don't measure how I'm doing compared to Paul the Apostle. I don't measure how I'm doing compared to how I used to do, and I don't measure how I'm doing compared to other men or women of God. I don't know what measuring does. If, if you measure and come out good, you have pride. If you come out bad, you're condemned. I don't know what you do with measuring. I don't try to figure out if I've gained ground. I, I'm loved, and I'm a budding lover, therefore I'm successful. Even if I'm better or worse than I was yesterday, or better or worse than you are, I'm still successful because I'm loved and I'm a lover. People have asked me, you know, a number of times, do you think you'll, you know, be one of the, you know, we'll talk about the end time, this or that, or, you know, just this, these kind of vague categories of walking in the higher realms of what God, I said, I don't ever think about it. I want to love God hard today. Basically, I want to see God hard today. And I just leave it right there. And I'm not just telling you that because it sounds right. I'm telling you because it really does work that way. The preoccupation with where you were yesterday, where someone else is, and where the, the, the great men and women of God in history are, I don't know how that helps us. Well, it spurs us on. I don't know that it does. I think their testimony, they discover joy in God, is what spurs us on. Knowing that David saw something that changed his human dynamics is enough to spur me on. Scale of 1 to 10, if he hit an 8, I don't care if he hit 6 or 8 or 12 on a scale of 10. It doesn't matter to me. I just want to know, if you see something, does it change your emotional chemistry? David says from Scripture, yes, it does. I go, good, thank you, David. I don't need you anymore. I don't want to study you to measure myself against you in a strange way, a religious way. I want to, I want to study you to see the dynamics and the principles that God used to touch your heart. And so that's what David did throughout his life. And that's, we're, we're, we're right in the, the Gibeon, the Adullam years. Those are the difficult times when David's, you see, he has the revelation, God's his portion. It's just not very strong. It's there. But he, he loses it a little and the pressure causes him to realign. The pressure causes the roots of that revelation to go deep. They're burned in our hearts, if you will, by pressure because pressure makes us do repetition. Pressure makes us go back to that source day in and day out, day in and day out. When the pressure is lifted and we're young in the Lord, we typically don't go drink at that well. We drink at the well of our blessing. The Lord lets the pressure come. We go, oh, I'm hurting. i got to find comfort. i got to find comfort. The only way is through the knowledge that I'm loved and I'm a lover. I can find pleasure in the discovery of who He is and who I am in Him. I'm loved and a lover, therefore I'm successful. That's the way I've summarized it, although there's many thoughts involved in those in that sentence. Many, many thoughts involved in that. And, and the Lord says, I'm going to let you have pressure because it drives you into that reality. It causes you to drink there primarily. And uh, it goes deep in you. It's called the Holy Spirit writing His Word upon the mind and the heart. He writes it upon the mind and the heart because pain, some people say, pain doesn't make good things happen. Pain creates the dilemma where you have to search for comfort, and it's the searching of the comfort in the right way that the Holy Spirit moves on. Pain doesn't change you. Pain forces you to search for answers to change you. Pain forces you to search for relief. It's the search for relief that is driving you. That's the power. And when you discover it in the Lord in ever-increasing ways, then we say pain has been used to change you. But pain embitters many, many people because they search for relief in ways they can't find it, and then they conclude there is no good under the sun. They get angry at life. They get angry just at everybody. Pain in itself doesn't help you. It's your response to pain. And it's not even just a positive attitude. It's the driving you to drink at the right well. To define success the right way is what pain drives you to do. And again, when you, you fill your mind with it and you get your speech around it, what ends up happening is that the Spirit of God, and that's the context the Spirit of God gives revelation to. He says, that reaching, that, that bringing your mind before me, that is what I will shoot the arrow into and cause the fire to ignite in the heart. A lot of people just fill all their time with other things, and, and they'll hear someone uh, preach on the Word of God, and they, and one of my real burdens, 
So it's the idea that the Word of God is often presented as something that we do. It's like a bargaining chip that, you know, if we'll read the Word, then God, will you then do good to us or will you like us? And the Lord's answer is, no, it doesn't work that way. You don't read the Word to make me like you. You don't read the Word to make me do good for you. It doesn't work that way. I already like you and I want to do good for you, but a lot of the good I want to do for you, if you're not connected to me right, will end up hurting you. So it'll hurt you more than you're hurting now. So it's not about you reading the Word as a bargaining chip with God. We read the Word because we want to find pleasure. John Piper says we're hedonists. We're Christian hedonists. We love pleasure. We, we're built by a God of pleasure to love pleasure. We just drink it the right well, that's all. I read the Word of God not to, to motivate God to like me or to motivate Him to give me bigger things. That's not why I read the Word. I read the Word because it's the, it's the place I can find relief from pain, I can find pleasure, and then the Lord says, well, the more you connect with me, the more I'm going to release the things I've ordained for you, because the things I've ordained for you now won't hurt you the more you're connected to me. So someone might say, well, you read the Word more, but your ministry's growing. I don't, no, that's later down the road. I read the Word to find relief from pain and to enter into pleasure. I don't read the Word as a grudging thing to get God to pay attention. I read the Word of God because I'm longing for pleasure. I'm craving for delight. And I know that the other things are broken well. So I read the Word and I go, Oh God, I don't feel it much, but I know in time I'll feel it. I know in time it will connect. And then the Lord says, Oh, you know those things I promised you, those earthly things? I can give you more of what's ordained for you. I'm not going to give you what was ordained for another man or another person. I'm going to give what was ordained for you in a greater measure. Because now the things that I've given you, the larger sphere won't hurt you the more you're connected to me. Every person's sphere is different. Reading the Word of God won't make your sphere big. Reading the Word of God will connect you to true pleasure so that the fullness of what God's promised you won't hurt you in the end of the day. The fullness of the earthly thing. It's not about getting a bigger earthly sphere of, of blessing. I crave delight. I love pleasure. That's why I'm radical, commit, radically committed to a lifestyle of meditating on the Word, because I love pleasure. I just love it. I've just been blessed enough to know where pleasure comes from. I've heard people say to me a, a handful of times over the year, well, you're disciplined. I go, no, no, it's not discipline. It's not discipline. That's not it. I crave pleasure. That's, what, that's my problem. That's my glory. That's my powers. I crave pleasure. I just was graced with understanding where pleasure comes from. I'm not disciplined. It doesn't take a, a hungry man disciplined to eat. You know, put a nice hot meal in front of him. Oh, you're so disciplined because they're eating. No, they're hungry. It has nothing to do with discipline. And the, the understanding that, that, that I've had, and many, many have. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not using myself as the example. I'm using myself. The reason I'm using myself is because I can speak with energy from what I've discovered with real passion because I know it's true. I know that it's true. Is that, that I found delight in it. And I don't mean on the front end. I knew that delight was there if I stayed with it. And I was just hungry for delight. And see, God gave David a special dose of that, if you will, in his youth to prepare him to be the author of Scripture, to, out of experience, to, because if he wouldn't have started until he was 70, you know, he would have had a hard time. He was tapping into this as a youth. It's very unusual. It's a very, very unusual thing. But the Lord, I believe, wants to begin to give this in a greater measure, this conviction that this is the well of pleasure. But when we have a, a, a spirit of religion on us that has an image of a God that's so different than the Bible describes, why would you go to Him to drink for pleasure? Because He's only going to beat the tar out of you if you go there. Just the whole approach to the Word is a sanctified, selfish approach. It's not to get God to pay attention. It's not to get God to give me more anointing. It's to take pain off my heart and to let me feel pleasure. And in that context, the Lord gives me more of that which was ordained. That isn't even my point, to get more. My point is to get the craving and the pounding in my heart satisfied. And the Lord blessed me by letting me, pointing me in the right, right direction. And saying, really this will work, stay with it, stay with it. I go, well, nothing else seems to work. And the Lord might whisper, I mean, I didn't hear this, but He might whisper, you're blessed among men because you believe that that's the path to pleasure. Everybody wants pleasure. Every hungry per person 
loves to eat when they're hungry. There's no problem with that. It's not about discipline. It truly is not about discipline. It's about understanding is what it is. It's not about discipline. You take that same hungry man and put a bowl of sand in front of him, he's just going to look at it and go, you know, the craving I have makes me stay away from it. It's not discipline. That, that looks like bad news to me. It's understanding that makes him eat the good meal and resist the bowl of sand. It's not discipline. It's understanding. That's why we need the spirit of revelation. The spirit of revelation, that will give us understanding. One of the greatest blessings that ever happened to me spiritually, I read a book when I was 19 years old or 20 years old. And in this book, this man said Ephesians 1.17 was the one prayer. He's about a 60-year-old man. He said, this is the one prayer I prayed my whole life every single day. I never even knew what Ephesians 1.17 was, really. I thought, well, maybe I've heard of it, but whatever. And I turned to it, and I... And I, ma and I made that prayer, Ephesians 1, 17, the prayer for revelation, the prayer of my life. And then I added John 17, 26 to it. I prayed it every single day that I prayed. And I, and I, and I began to have the regular devotional times. I, I would, I would uh, put them in my life. And that was the first prayer always I prayed because some guy in a book told me to do it. Now, what if the guy in the book would have told me the main thing in life is to get more anointing for ministry and to get more financial blessing to do this and that, I would have pursued that hard and not the spirit of revelation. The Lord says, I'll give you anything you can't live without. I'll give you if it's in my will. And I, of course, it was the Lord's blessing, but from my point of view, it was an accident. I stumbled into Ephesians 1.17. I mean, it wasn't like I had any different. I go, okay. I go, this guy prays a lot. I'll do what he did. I, it sounds like a straight... It didn't even seem like a good verse to me, to be honest. I said, okay, I'll do it. Well, Paul did it. It's in the Bible. It doesn't make that much sense to me. And I just locked into it for years, literally for 20 years. Now I look back and the Lord has unfolded revelation mostly about the fact there's delight in God. That's the primary revelation. It's that one. And it just makes it easier to stay connected. And again, somebody might say you have discipline. I go, no, I just have a little understanding of one major thing. I know where fresh water is. I challenge you. Be men and women that asks for the spirit of revelation. I can't think of anything that changes the heart more than that. Like I prayed, when we see what David saw, we'll worship like David worshiped. It's a matter of seeing. It's not a matter of discipline. It's a matter of seeing. Hunger will cause you to do the extravagant hours before the Lord. Hunger will make that happen, not discipline. Well, it's a nice long introduction, wasn't it? First Samuel 19. Verse 9, we looked at this story a little bit last week, but the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat, came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. I tell you, you didn't want Saul to have the spear with that funny mood came on him. Your name was David. But anyway, the spirit came on him. He already had the spear in his hand and, the, and that evil spirit or that spirit of oppression that tormented him came upon him. If Saul would have had a, a right heart, that torment would have driven him to God to seek relief of it. But it didn't. It's, it's, it drove him to seek relief from circumstances being different. David was playing music with his hand. He's having his personal worship time in the other room. The spirit of oppression comes on Saul. He says, where's David? He hears the music. This is the third time now it's recorded that the spirit of oppression comes upon him, this distressing spirit. We find it in chapter 16, verse 14. And we find it in chapter 18, verse 10. This is the third occasion where this heavy, tormenting spirit comes upon him. And again, it drives Saul to find his relief in circumstances. And Because a person with a, a tormenting spirit can cry out to the Lord. They really can. They need help and there's... And, and, it's, and it's more difficult, but they don't have to just go to natural things to find relief. So what happens? Verse 10, Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear. Now, I think this is probably the third time this has happened now. But he slips away from Saul's presence. And he drove the spear into the wall. Now, if you remember right, verse 6, David, Saul made this great promise that he wasn't going to kill David. And then verse 7, David's returned back to Saul's court because David's been out for a while and says, I'm not moving back in there. No way. And so Saul makes a vow. Jonathan intercedes for him, for his father. 
Things are calm for a while. The war breaks out. You know, maybe a month or a year. Who knows? I don't know how much time. Some time passes. Things are relaxed again. David's having his devotional time. And this tormenting spirit comes on Saul again. And now it's just business as usual again. Saul's, I mean, a, a sword stuck in the, a spear stuck in the wall, and David's looking at it going, this, this is trouble. This is serious trouble. Verse 11, Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him. He posted a guard, a, like a secret police military watch around his house to watch for him, to kill him in the morning when he came out. Watch him all night. If he sneaks, sneaks out tonight, get him. Wait for him tomorrow morning when he goes to uh, do his job. When he gets out, just kill him. And we'll come up with some excuses to what happened. Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, if you don't save your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. If you don't escape tonight, they will kill you. Saul's daughter whispers in David's ear. So Michael let David down through the window. He escaped. In verse 13 and 14, she takes this image. The statue, we just think of the word statue and puts, you know, blanket around it, put some hair around it. And the guys come in and look, okay, he's sick, there he is, and David's running. He's, he's out of here by now. Verse 17, Saul rebukes his daughter and says, why have you deceived me? You sent my enemy away. Look how demented Saul is. That's what jealousy does. David was his most loyal person, but David looks like an enemy because of this tormenting spirit. Verse 18, Saul fled and escaped and went to the prophet Samuel, Ramah. And then that episode of the prophetic spirit stopping Saul from getting David. All these different means of deliverance, God is showing David that God is showing David that God can deliver him any way that he wants. He really wants David to realign his heart is what's going on. Verse 20, then David fled from Ramah, from Saul's, I mean, from the prophet Samuel's house. He talks to Jonathan one more time. He goes, what is the deal? What is my sin? What's the problem? The true answer is this. The real answer to what is my problem is, your problem is, you have a major calling. No, you have a calling to have major responsibility. Every calling is a major calling. Every calling is important to the one who designed the call, the invitation. Whatever call God has given you is a very, very important call because the God of Genesis 1 and His infinite wisdom devised the call for you. It's not a bad invitation. Believe me, every call is a good call. Because it was handmade, tailor-made for you. And God will reward you according to it. But I mean, he had a call for uh, major responsibility before God's people. And David's problem was, what is my problem? Is what he was really saying. What is the deal? The deal is this. The roots have to go deep in you, David, because the earthly blessing you will have will corrupt you if your roots aren't deep. That is your problem. Your problem is the measure of your calling. The intensity of the training is related to the sphere of responsibility that you have, David. You have to be able to weather the counterattack. You have to be able to overcome the temptations of pride that come with blessing. God wants you to find your joy and your delight and your reward in Him, not in the great measure. And so the Lord's going to withhold the measure for 20 years. He withheld it from 20 years. It was prophesied over him when he was 17. He became king of Israel, not Judah, but all of Israel when he's 37. It took 20 years. The Lord says, I'm going to withhold it for 20 years so that you won't be corrupted by the temptations to pride or you won't be unequipped for the counterattack in spiritual warfare when Satan's rage comes against you. You know the phrase, new levels, new devils. New levels of in God, there's new demonic levels of attack against you. New levels, new devils. The Lord is preparing David to withstand the counterattack of Satan and to withstand the assault of pride because he has more than others have in natural things. The two great things that assault the soul of man. David says, God, God says to David, I'm going to so build your heart into me being as your reward that you'll have the equipment to withstand Satan and the power to say no to pride because you'll get pleasure from me, not from what you rule. That's the problem with David. His calling was big in the earthly sense. So he had to have deep foundations. His, call, his problem was God assigned him a seminary course under a demonized king who had an army at his command. God says, I'm going to train you in my seminary. I'm going to give a king with a powerful army as your seminary course. 
I can take care of this king at will and I can take care of his army. I want him to come after you because I want you connecting with me day by day, David. Well, Lord, I already know that you're my reward, but you're really going to know at the end of this one. It's going to go deep. Verse 3, that spirit of despair touches David for the first time. He says, I know I'm going to die. Basically, I know I'm going to die. Well, David, you have all this revelation about the glory of God and creation. Now you think God can't save you. Well, I know he can save me, but it just feels like I'm going to die. The Lord says, David, do you understand your emotions? I'm trying to stabilize you. And it takes time for me to write truth on your heart. It takes time. So Jonathan said to David, no, um, uh, let, let's go to verse uh, 33. The determination now comes. The determination to kill David. Now it's set in Saul's court. It's established. He's going to kill David. There's no question. But the determination is there. Verse 41 and 42. Jonathan, second to the last time, he goes out to see David one more time. He doesn't intercede for him before Saul anymore because Saul gets really mad, tries to kill him. So he quits. He actually quits speaking up for David in the king's court, as far as we know. Verse 41 and 42. They have one more time together and then just before your own notes, chapter 23, verse 16, is the final time Jonathan and David are together. 23, 16. This is the second to the last time. Let's turn to Psalm 59. Psalm 59. Just We can only look at it just briefly, just a few thoughts. Again, uh, the, the, the value of this course isn't what you hear in an hour. It's what you do in your prayer life with what you hear. If these psalms don't enter into your prayer life, this course was just interesting at best, if in fact it's interesting to you. But if this thing gets into your prayer life, these, if the language of these psalms actually makes it to your prayer vocabulary, not that you have to use the exact phraseology, that's not my point, but the truths of these psalms get into your life in God, your private life in God, your secret life in God, then transformation comes. And so you're going to have to study these psalms. This course is just a, a big advertisement. It's like, study Psalm 8, study Psalm 29, study Psalm 59. And I'm just, I'm just giving you some of the menu of where to go feast on in your private life. And so I, I, I plead with you that if this is all that you do with this course, at best you were just whatever is happening to you between now and the end of the evening is the best that's going to happen. It won't really make any impact. These things have to get into your dialogue with God in your private time or they will not transform your emotions. That's what I love studying this because it, it recaptures me and gives me new understanding of new verses and then I get to bring it into my personal life. Not all of it because I don't remember all of it, but just key things get into my personal life and it's like, well, yes! And then some years will pass and this course will have touched me by the grace of God. Not because I'm speaking it here, but because a few of these verses are going to lodge in my spirit and become a part of my personal, my secret life in God, my personal history in the Lord, my secret history. Look at Psalm 59. Look what it says. It's a mishtum of David. Or a composition of David, a, a writing of David. There's a lot of debate as to exactly what a mishtum is, but it, why is it different than another type? And, and the Hebrew word is not really clear. It's exactly... The, the, the distinction between some of these psalms, so I'm, I won't attempt to uh, be a scholar. I'm not one. I'm a lover. But anyway, though you can be a scholar and a lover, that's not a, a statement against scholars. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a psalm of David when Saul sent men that they would watch the house in order to kill him. It's the episode we just read. This tells you what David was thinking. This pulls the, uh, the curtain back, so to speak. Psalm is broken down in, in two big divisions, verse 1 to 9, verse 10 to 17. Just for interest, it says to the chief musician, I'm back at the title again, set to do not destroy, which was, which was a, a well-known piece of music in that day. And nobody knows for sure what it means, but it was, it was commonly known enough for the, those that compiled the five books of Psalms. The, the 150 Psalms are arranged in five different books, and they were developed over a, a large, a long period of time. But 
the, the ones the Holy Spirit used to bring this together said it was set to, and it was a piece of music that was commonly known called Do Not Destroy. But you're going to read Psalm 57 and Psalm 58. They are set to the same set, uh, music. Those three psalms go together. They're not from the exact moment of David's life, but they, they carry one theme, and they were set to the same music when they were used in the worship the temple of God, uh, in the worship of God in the temple. Psalm 57, 58, 59 are three of them strategically set alongside each other. And that's what's going on. So David is telling us what he was thinking under the Holy Spirit's guidance when, I mean, he's giving a Holy Spirit a record of what he was thinking because God wanted his pain journey and process to inspire us and to instruct us. So it's what was happening when the that guard was posted outside of his house. Verse 1, deliver me, O God. I'm just pulling a few phrases out. Number one point, don't minimize it. God is David's source, not Saul, not the other uh, commanders in the army. David had a number of good buddies in the, in the high command of Saul's army. He didn't put out a mailing list against Saul. He didn't tell his story. He didn't take it to the courts of men. And I'm not saying there's, it's always wrong to appeal to a court. David knew the problem was severe and appealed to God. He saw God as his source. That's a major revelation in verse 1. He said, I can argue, and I believe in godly appeals. Godly appeals in a gentle spirit with patience do make an impact sometimes. Mostly they don't, but they do every now and then. You never know when they're going to work. Most godly appeals to, us, to human authorities come up short. Sometimes they really make a difference, and you never know, so you, so you make godly appeals. You, make, you do it in kindness, you do it in humility, and you do it with patience. Without threatening, without a stirred-up spirit. The Scripture teaches a number of ways with a gentle spirit looking to yourself, with patience, leaving it at God's hands if those, if those, those authorities over you don't take your story. You leave it with God. That's the godly appeal. Most people don't really do the godly appeal, or they don't appeal to God Himself. They just appeal to man. They take it to the court of, of a man at the, at the bar of gossip, and they tell their story to every, you know, it's, it's like the old saying, any dog that will, hear, that will take a, a bone will carry a bone. The person will hear it, they'll typically carry it. And we're all built that way. So if you're under conviction, you're just being honest. If you're not under conviction, you're probably a little deceived. Every one of us have a propensity to, to settle our problems in the earthly, in the earthly courts of, of man, in the bar of gossip is what I'm talking about. We just take it and we say, can you believe they did this to me? And the other person goes, no, no, I can't, well, let's do something. And they, and a little flurry of activity stirs up and everybody rolls around and then they all say it different and then we have three more meetings. Now, I didn't really say that to you when I, you told them I said that they said. That's not what I said. And yes, you did say that when you told me that. And it gets all confusing and carnal and everybody loses connection with God and things get worse. And then David says, let's skip that part for now. I'm going to the court of heaven. I'm taking my... That is a massive statement he's saying in verse 1 when he says, To God, deliver me. He means not Saul, not his buddies in the court, not his buddies in the, war, in, in the military, not his financial friends because he's the head of the army for a time. He had some financial friends. I'm not taking it there. I'm taking it one place is what he's saying. That was one of the great powers of David's life because David said, not only is that the only place I can fix it, it's the place that I get changed while God's changing the circumstance. Because when you take it to God, things change in your thinking and in your emotions when you appeal to God. When I take what people do wrong to me to God, I think different. I don't mean just the circumstance. I don't mean I walk away thinking, you know, they really were right. No, I don't mean that. I, I typically leave and go, they really were creeps. If you'll pray about it, bad guys will look good to you. That, you know, that sounds nice. It's just not real. Bad guys typically end up looking bad to you, even when you pray about them. Someone ripped you off, they ripped you off. If you can come up with a little 1% idea of why they didn't mean to rip you off, that's wonderful. But at the end of the day, that doesn't really motivate you or stabilize you. When I appeal to God, it's not so much... The reason I say that, because I typically hear people say it that way. I run into God, the rock, the fountain of truth. And He says, let me give you some big picture ideas of what's going on. 
And I don't hear some voice, but just one little phrase at a time over the weeks and months and years, the big picture, the puzzle starts coming into focus. And then the Lord says, and I will not just change the way you think about your whole paradigm of life and time and eternity. It all gets changed when you take your pain to God. Things look different. Your philosophy changes because I will sometimes change the circumstance. Literally, God can change things that even Saul couldn't have changed. So we take it to God so that He'll change circumstances, but that maybe that's our motive, that He'll change the circumstances, but God's motive is it changes the way we think. And when we think different, we feel different, we act different, we do everything different when we think different. And verse 1 brought, God, brought David to the fountain of eternal wisdom for the big picture. And one of David's great glories in his life is the way he could see the big picture was absolutely fantastic how he saw the big picture. And one of the reasons he took pain to God instead of venting it to get a band-aid comfort that never lasted anyway. Venting gives you a momentary comfort, but you have to get comforted again, and you never run into the fountain of wisdom that way. And typically, God doesn't hear your prayer and then answer the circumstances. I've normally gone to God so He'd make the circumstance better, but He ends up changing a little bit that vast, complex puzzle of life. The big picture gets more clear when you take it to God. And every now and then, I see that the bad guy wasn't so bad, but honestly, that's not normally what happens. I'm normally pretty resolved. They really did lie. They did it. That's all there is to it. But when you get locked into the big picture, it's not the reason you have more mercy is because you just feel different about stuff when you get in big, and, the, and so the pain of it feels different because things don't matter as much when you're connected to the big picture. That's the power of verse one right there. Deliver me, O God. That's a massive. The implications of that are massive. That approach to solving problems and to getting Pain relieved in your heart is a massively brilliant way to interface you with the fountain of wisdom. But what we do is we put the little band-aid comfort things, we vent it with people, we don't have to interface with God, we don't have to do the love lover, uh, you know, way to find pleasure, we don't, in, we don't turn it to prayer, and we just, just get a little embittered, little, you know, little, uh, this, this little, uh, Oh, what's, what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, our spirits just get dim and diluted and crusty and we just get little residues of bitterness lay hold of us and boy, we just don't want to do that. Taking it to God is godly, but it's not just godly, it's really the smart way to fix your life. It's not just that it's godly, it is, but it's brilliant too. It really is smart. Take your car to a mechanic. Don't try to fix it yourself. If you've never said it, take your soul to the author of the human soul. He really, really can fix you better. Deliver me. Oh, God. Oh, my God. What a sentence. Oh, my God. It's all right there. Well, David, verse 2, he's convinced that they're really bad guys. He doesn't, he doesn't figure out some way to, to where they're good. He knows that they're bloodthirsty. Verse 3, he says, uh, I'm innocent in essence. The mighty gather against me. The mighty are the political and the military leaders of the nation in Saul's court. He says, the mighty ones. He goes, beloved, this, this is serious stuff that's going on in David's life. But they're not, he understands this. There's no false humility. He says, they're not gathering against me because I've done, I haven't sinned. He goes, I'm not saying I, I don't sin. He goes, but I haven't sinned against Saul. I haven't been disloyal to Saul. I haven't, I'm not doing, this isn't about sinning. The, the political, the mighty ones, the military, political, and the economic leaders of the nation were, you know, in the fear of man before Saul because they'd lose their jobs, so they all ganged up against David to save their own jobs. He goes, this wasn't about sin. And the Lord says, you're right, David. I'm the one that showed that to you. It's not because you, you slandered Saul and Saul caught you, therefore fired you. That's not what happened. I'm building something deep in you. I'm building you for the future on the earth and for eternity. That's why. And, the, and one reason you know besides it says it's, it's this season of David's life when David is still in his early 20s. Because we, we know he's in his early 20s in 1 Samuel 19. We also know because in all the later Psalms, almost without fail, David almost always without fail when he gets in that pain, relief of pain mode, he always discusses his guiltiness and his transgression. 
There were two seasons in David's life when he was being persecuted from the government, from the military, political, and economic social leaders of the nation. The first one when he was young under Saul, the second one when he was old under Absalom. And whenever he's talking about the people of God pursuing him, typically he's not talking about the unbelievers because he was defeating them with, with, I exaggerate to say effortlessly, but he was defeating them with a really good track record. The Philistines felt pursued by By him, more than they felt, he felt pursued by them. When he's talking about the wicked that are coming against me, typically he's meaning the political, economic, and social leaders under Saul's leadership when he was young or Absalom's leadership when he's old. It's almost all the Psalms are in those two seasons, the Psalms of pain I'm talking about. And almost without fail, if it's at the older time, it's he acknowledges the number of sins that he did, particularly the problem of uh, his adultery with Bathsheba and the murdering of Uriah and the murdering of Uriah, the Lord says, I will cause trouble from your own house. And he acknowledges every time that his son caused him trouble. He says, I did contribute to this, Lord. I know this. He was talking about more than just his general sin being born in sin. He goes, I know I murdered a man and you said there'd be trouble in my house because of it. And he acknowledges sin. But here, he doesn't, he doesn't acknowledge his sin. He's not uh, resisting the doctrine of original sin. That's not what he's resisting. He's saying, I didn't lie against Saul, and he caught me, and therefore I got fired. He says, I didn't do anything. And that's one of the characteristic Davidic uh, uh, trends of the early Psalms, is that he, he does not acknowledge guilt, but at the last he does. It's not because he's older and wiser, therefore he acknowledges guilt. That's not because he really did murder Uriah, and his son Absalom was the fruit of that. It really, it's, he's not being falsely humble. He's being very divine justice that David has a vision of. He says two things in verse 4 in the New King James. He says, awake to help me and behold. I love it. He tells, asks God to awake and he asks God to look. I love those, that, that imagery of David. Awake and look. In other words, he says, God, in terms of my circumstances, you are sleeping. Wake up. Lord, wake up. In other words, take active intervention is what it means to awake. Take active intervention. He's picturing God is slumbering related to this event in his life. And God himself depicts himself this way. And then he asks God to look at him. Behold, let your face stare at my face. Look at me, God. Let's look eye to eye. Change my circumstances. Awake. And behold me. Look at my, at my face and my heart as I look at yours. And let's have communion in the process. Awake and behold. I love those two lines there. Those two phrases. Verse 5. This is one of the real major themes of David that we'll have to look at at another time. But I just want to, there's, I want to mention it because we're going to close in just a few moments here. One of the major themes of David is here in verse 5. You therefore, O God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to punish all the nations. Do not be merciful to any of my wicked transgressors. That sounds... Like David is being vindictive, he's not. There's something so much bigger going on there. David understands with great clarity the distinction between, the, the great distinction between immaturity and rebellion. He always calls on mercy to an immature believer who, who's, who's saying in their heart, I want to, I want to do this thing for you, God, but are, are struggling. Matter of fact, that's David's number one characteristic is his confidence and mercy when he sins. What David is tapping into something bigger than this session right now. David has a spirit of revelation about the goodness of righteousness that happens to last forever and forever. He's tapping into the, the glory and the goodness that at the core of everything is a righteous God that causes everything that's not good to stop. He's tapping into that, and whether it's an eternal judgment or temporal judgments, he says, everything that you do that stops what's not good, that removes what's not good, that's locked in against what is good, it is good for you to do that, God. That's his doctrine of judgment. His doctrine of judgment is his passion for what is good to be established. And he sees, by revelation, this is an opinion that he's talking about men who are locked in fiercely against the Spirit of God. I don't mean believers who don't believe in healing. That's not what I mean. I mean they're, they're locked in against God. And he says, Lord, whether in time or eternity, your temporal or your eternal judgments, 
Stop the people who refuse good. Don't let them corrupt what is good. Let good, the glory of who you are, let it go on forever and forever and let it come into our experience. That's what he's praying for. Because one thing that God's going to do to the prophetic singers, and I'll just give the little prophetic singers up, kind of a little hint on this if they don't already know. It is amazing when you read the 73 Psalms of David that, that we know are David's Psalms, and several more are David's Psalms, but they just don't have his name on them. Maybe nearly a hundred Psalms are, are Davidic Psalms. It's amazing. Amazing. The uh, prominence David gives to songs, prophetic songs, that magnify God's judgments, His temporal and His eternal judgments. Right now you can't find hardly a prophetic song in the earth that sees the goodness and the glory of temporal or eternal judgments. But David, the tabernacle of David, the prophetic worshiper, carried that theme continually because he saw the beauty of it. And of course, the church is not instructed in the, in the beauty and the glory of justice and righteousness. But that's something that we will develop a, a, a lot more. You know, I just want to introduce this idea. It's one of his major themes of his singing is the beauty of judgment and of, of of uh, God's retribution against that that absolutely will not yield to what is good. And it's for goodness sake that David loves this. David, look at verse 6. He describes their heart. Actually, it's verse 6 and then verse 14 and 15. He describes their heart. And what they are, are they're, they're like a pack of dogs. Wild, hungry, savage dogs. He goes... They go around like these killer dogs growling and, and sniffing for the scent of something they can devour. They were in the Middle uh, East, they, there were these wild dogs like a pack of wolves that would roam the countryside. And David describes it in verse 6 and 14 and 15. He says they're like savage, hungry, killer dogs. He goes, they, they basically they have no conscience, no sensitivity to what is good and what is right before you. He says, stop them. Verse 7 and 12. I'll leave you uh, just another thought or two, and then we're going to end. He talks about evil speech. That's one of David's key thoughts, is evil speech. He constantly, he constantly brings before uh, the people evil speech. And one of the reasons David's so against evil speech, I mean, there's a dozen reasons why evil speech is bad, but the main reason I believe David is against evil speech for the righteous is that it gets them off the hook of interfacing with God. And then they never interface with wisdom, truth, and they never get changed. Because if you go vent and put a band-aid on your soul, you'll hurt again tomorrow and you'll never be different. Don't vent this thing. Take it to the source, the fountain of eternal wisdom who has great power as well. He will change the circumstances occasionally, but he will change the way you think mostly. And if you vent it through just saying it to someone on the phone and getting it off, taking the burden off, putting a band-aid, he says, you... You lose the glory of being transformed in this thing. That's not the only reason, but that is one of David's key reasons why he wouldn't speak evil, because he wouldn't do the interfacing. Verse 7 and 12, he does it over and over and over. Then verse 9, he magnifies the need to wait on God. The waiting. Waiting, there's two things in waiting. There's a time frame. It takes patience to wait. It takes patience. It may be months or years. In David's case, it was about seven years before Saul was taken care of. There's a time dimension of patience, but then there's a heart, heart posture of devotion in waiting before God. When you wait before God, you interface with Him. You interact with Him. There's a devotional posture, and there's a time dimension to waiting on God. There's two dimensions to waiting. In the waiting, you're saying, Oh God, I love you. You talk to God. There's a devotional part. And in waiting, months and sometimes years go by before changes take place in circumstances. He believed in waiting. Verse 10, verse 16 and 17, he magnifies mercy. He magnifies mercy. He sings about it, but his mercy is not a mercy that contradicts judgment. To him, mercy and judgment were two sides of one coin of one good God. Mercy and judgment were not paradoxical themes that confused him. And he just said, well, I don't get it. I sang it and I was anointed and I'll sing the other side this time. They made sense to him that they were one and the same God he sang about. Amen. Stand. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com.
Thank you.